Thank you for joining us. India and Israel have a very special and historic relationship. In fact, the Indian and Jewish people share a rich and deep relationship which dates back to ancient times. Jews were one of the first foreign groups in recorded history to arrive and settle in India and became an integral part of Indian society. Our guest today is His Excellency Navtej Sarna, the Ambassador of India to the United States of America. Ambassador Sarna served previously as India's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom and Ambassador to Israel, and he will join us following these messages. The mission of the Life Extension Foundation is to support scientific research and to gather and disseminate information related to the delay and eventual elimination of disease, aging, and premature death. The Foundation is careful to commit its research dollars to projects that are difficult or impossible to fund with government dollars, institutional grants, or through other funding sources. It is essential to make anti-aging research a priority today to prevent a health care catastrophe caused by aging baby boomers overwhelming our health care systems. Human age reversal. We may be there already. Human studies are now ready to begin to confirm meaningful reversal of pathological aging processes. These clinical trials aim to alter older humans so that they function as much younger individuals. Even modest success will result in a paradigm shift that will impart enormous societal benefits, such as sparing Medicare from insolvency. Life extension is not standing idle while 5,000 Americans die each day from age-related illnesses. Joining us are physician scientists who want to hurry up these technologies to keep people from aging to death. While life extension is pushing these projects forward, we need financial help to ensure these studies are carried through to fruition. Find magic again. Sprout by HP. With Intel RealSense technology inside, now you can bend the rules of creativity outside.
This is a, a dawn of a new era in the great friendship between India and Israel. It began with Prime Minister Modi's historic visit to Israel, which uh, created tremendous enthusiasm. It continues with my visit here, which I must say is deeply moving for my wife and me and for the entire people of Israel. And I think it heralds a flourishing of our partnership to bring prosperity uh, and peace and progress for both our peoples. Thank you. With us now is His Excellency Ambassador Naftesh Sana. A real honor and pleasure to have you here, Mr. Thank Ambassador. You. Thank you. I've long been an admirer of India, and it is exciting today to witness a period in history when India and Israel are closer than ever. What are your thoughts on that? I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we've had a great uh, year, actually a great couple of years, when our president visited uh, Israel, then our prime minister visited Israel, which was the first visit by an Indian prime minister to Israel. And recently, we've had the visit of Prime Minister Netanyahu to India. So it's a relationship which is working very well. It's a relationship which is increasingly developing new areas of cooperation. And uh, it's a strong manifestation of what two democracies can do with each other. You're the most important ambassador of India, the greatest and largest democracy in the world, and the most prominent ambassador to the United States of America. How do you see the challenges facing our world today in general? Which is an unpleasant question. I apologize, but I'd like to hear your view on that. Well, I suppose at every, every point of time, uh, the world has faced uh, different challenges. Uh, uh, and I think there are, the idea is to how to cooperate with each other, how to put together our combined good sense and, and overcome them. And I think there are, uh, you know, it, different parts of the world face different challenges, but then there are some common challenges. There are challenges of the threat to peace, there are challenges of poverty, there are challenges of hunger, uh, there are challenges like terrorism. Uh, so I think depending upon uh, the particular challenge, there will be an appropriate response. But I think for that to happen, uh, that's why we have uh, relations between countries. That's why we have uh, discussions between countries so that we can develop a basis for our cooperation. Uh, you, you did mention uh, the India-Israel relationship. And I can say some of the challenges there being faced are being countered collectively. For instance, we, uh, the challenges of feeding our people uh, and uh, there's been a very strong cooperation between India and Israel in, in agriculture, in how to have higher productivity. Uh, the use of water, uh, the correct use of water to bring in new technologies for purifying water, for cleaning water, for uh, recycling water, and of course for, for irrigation. So I think relations between two countries uh, and between a set of countries certainly help us to respond to these challenges. It is so exciting to see the implementation of scientific and intelligent solutions to problems on this earth and uh, I have great admiration for India being in the forefront of technology, science and research in so many areas. Thank you. I think we have been uh, blessed with a scientific temper uh, in many ways and we have been uh, 
very successful in, in uh, training our people in, as engineers, scientists, uh, doctors, and they made a name for themselves uh, all over the world. And I think there is much more to be done because we have a very, very young population. We have uh, about 800 million people under the age of 35. And I think they are, they are the future. They are the ones who, who need the skills and the qualifications and, and uh, a scientific uh, approach to life to solve the problems of development. I have a politically incorrect question to ask you, which is somewhat critical of the superficiality that seems to be pervasive throughout our world today in many countries. But I think less so in India, where family values seem to be far closer to the hearts of people than in many other countries where the culture is different. What are your thoughts regarding that? Well, you know, I think every uh, country has its own uh, culture and its own uh, way of life. And in Indian culture, um, family and uh, society have always had, had uh, a great premium, uh, family links, uh, um, uh, respect for elders, uh, living in a, I, how should I say, social uh, obligations or social uh, uh, collective effort like on festivals and so on. A lot of importance has always traditionally been uh, attached to these. And in many ways it's, it's very good. It gives a, a good uh, uh, safety net uh, for people in many ways. I'd like to get it personal if I may for a second and ask you, your career is outstanding and you've been uh, the commissioner, the high commissioner in England where I'm from originally and uh, please share this with our audience. Well, uh, that's, uh, uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a very interesting uh, career. I've, this is my, I've finished, uh, this is my 38th year as a diplomat. So most of my, my life, uh, this is all that I've done. Uh, and I've been very, very fortunate to have served in some very exciting places uh, in, uh, at different uh, uh, times. And I started in East Europe. I, my first uh, post was in Soviet Russia. Uh, I've served in communist Poland. Uh, then I've gone on to serve in the neighborhood uh, which is in a s small and very beautiful country called Bhutan. I carried on uh, to do other things. I've, I've been an ambassador to Israel. Uh, and I've been High Commissioner, as you mentioned, to the UK and then Ambassador to the United States. So it's been a, it's been a, a great mix of countries, uh, civilizations, uh, different languages, uh, different customs. Uh, it's, a, it's been a rich bag and uh, I feel blessed by it. In addition to all of this, you're also an author. In fact, you wrote a book about Israel. Please tell us about it. I was fortunate to be uh, able to write a book while in Israel uh, on uh, the Indian connection to uh, Israel, to, to Jerusalem specifically speaking. Uh, and it's called Indians at Herod's Gate. So as you know, in Jerusalem, there are many hospices uh, from ancient times of pilgrims, uh, whether they be Christian or uh, Muslim, uh, coming uh, to, to, to Jerusalem and uh, staying as, in these hospices. So one such hospice is the Indian hospice, which goes back to the 12th century. So my book basically traces uh, uh, the, how that, you know, the history of that hospice, its present condition, and all that it's been through, particularly in the last 100 years. Uh, it's a very interesting, uh, very beautiful place in the old city. So that, that uh, helped me research a bit more about the Indian connection. Of course, we do know the the presence of Indian Jews, which is uh, more obvious uh, uh, in, in Israel, which we have about 80,000 uh, uh, Jewish people of Indian origin in, in uh, Israel, who, as you know uh, better than me, are, are unique in a way that they came to Israel uh, not out of any persecution, uh, unlike many, most of the other people who came to Israel. So they, they have come and they, they have equal affection for both Israel as well as for India and form a great bond. But this book uh, that I wrote is about uh, the uh, pilgrims who used to uh, come and, they, uh, on, and, and the hospice that was built on the, uh, on the basis that a 
great Sufi saint of uh, the 12th century, Baba Farid. He actually came and meditated there. And then his followers began to uh, uh, expand that hospice and how this has gone on through eight centuries. So much could be achieved in this world through cooperation and intelligence solutions and communication. And that's the area that you are an expert in. What message would you like to share with our audience as we approach conclusion of this interview? Well, I think all of us are doing, are trying to do a job with a, with a certain purpose, with a certain uh, worldview in life. And as far as, uh, I think, as far as India is concerned and Indians are concerned, and perhaps that's our message to the world, that uh, the world can live uh, in cooperation. The world can live uh, in, in, in brotherhood. Uh, differences uh, are, are not something which should defeat us, but should actually strengthen us. And diversity is, is a strength. So I, I think there is a, uh, India has its own lesson to the world. We are perhaps the most multilingual, multi-religious, multi-ethnic uh, society that you can find. And we have managed to exist uh, for a very, very long time. A land of a great culture and history, and there was really great culture in India long before it existed uh, in Europe. People were still living in caves in Europe while India already was a developed entity. Well, we are, we are an ancient civilization, and we do go back a long time, uh, like some others. And, uh, well, we are very fortunate that we've had it for so long. Mr. Ambassador, this has been a great privilege and honor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thanks. I'll be right back. You know, it has been a journey, and some of you have been with me in that journey. I see some people who were there when it didn't make sense to be there, and it and helped me when I was going, running for governor when it, all of that um, didn't work. But I tell you that I've said often, I am the proud daughter of Indian parents who reminded my brothers, my sister, and me every day how blessed we were to live in this country. Throughout 3,000 years of civilization, foreign conquest, exile, and return, Jerusalem has remained their spiritual home. For nearly 70 years, the city of Jerusalem has been the capital of the state of Israel, despite many attempts by others to deny that reality. The American people are less patient. In 1948, the United States was the first nation to recognize the independent state of Israel. In 1995, the U.S. Congress declared that Jerusalem should be recognized as the capital of Israel and that the U.S. Embassy should be located in Jerusalem. Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama all agreed with that position. Welcome. Thank you. It's Good such a you. pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, good to see you here. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm so excited to be here in Israel. Well, good. You met, you met our palatial uh, establishment. I did. In our uh, empirical surroundings. Yes, <laughs> yes. No, it's beautiful. We're very excited. So thank you for seeing me. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you for all your help in standing up for Israel, standing up for the truth, which is uh, standing up for America. Actually, I think it's standing up for the UN. Yeah. as it was originally conceived. You know, that's all I've done is tell the truth. It's, and it's kind of overwhelming at the reaction. The Indo-Israel project is a revolutionary step taken by the Indian government in the agriculture sector towards the supply of fruits and vegetables. A bilateral agreement on cooperation in the agriculture sector was signed in May 2006. Two projects to work upon fruits and vegetables with scientific technology were initiated. 
one being the center of excellence for vegetables at Gharonda Karnal in July 2009 which was inaugurated in January 2011 and the second was a center of excellence for fruits at Mangiana Sirsa initiated in July 2009 and was inaugurated in May 2013 Since its independence in 1948, the country has overcome obstacles like water scarcity and limited land through constant innovation and enhanced technology. An outstanding system of agricultural research and development has provided Israeli farmers with brilliant results, allowing Israel to share its breakthroughs with other countries. India has partnered with Israel to boost the agricultural sector and to meet the demands of a growing nation. In 2040 or 2045, we are the biggest country in terms of population, and the land will be the limiting factor in India. So, if we don't change our traditional growing vegetables method, not possible to feed the population. In 2008. Governments of India and Israel introduced a joint project. It was aimed to increase the quality and quantity of the farmer's yield and to create new horticultural avenues while optimizing the use of resources. With a significant impact on households across India, the project offers a holistic approach to ensure food security and sustainability. This is about partnership and friendship between Israel and India. The Indo-Israel Agriculture Project is being implemented by MIDH, Ministry of Agriculture of India, State Governments of India, Embassy of Israel in India, and Mashav, Israel's Agency for International Development. One of the key roles of the Centers of Excellence is generating applied research. Trials and demonstrations show the benefit of new technologies and thus reduce the risk factor for an individual farmer. As I'm working in the extension service in Israel, it's my main goal to increase the income of the farmer. We can do it by sharing our knowledge with the centers. Knowledge is disseminated through three methodologies: train the trainers, creating sustainable centers that are fully operated by local teams trained in Israel and further mentored by Israeli experts. Extension services, channeling the information and professional knowledge from the centers directly to the farmers. open days farmers are invited to visit the centers for demonstrations and hands-on exposure to new technology the centers showcase a range of protective cultivation technologies from high-tech nurseries naturally ventilated poly houses walk-in tunnels and net houses जब से हमने इसको किया है स्टार्ट तब से हमारी क्वालिटी भी बड़ी है और पैदावार बड़ी है और इनकम भी बड़ी है दिस एंड सिमिलर सक्सेस स्टोरीज हैव बिकम अ रियलिटी थ्रू द इंडो इजराइल एग्रीकल्चर प्रोजेक्ट एड्रेसिंग ग्लोबल चैलेंजेस ऑफ फूड सिक्योरिटी एंड सस्टेनेबिलिटी दिस ग्रोइंग पार्टनरशिप बिटवीन इंडिया एंड इजराइल इज प्रोवाइडिंग फार्मर्स विद ग्रेटर अपॉर्चुनिटीज एंड ब्रिंगिंग अ सिग्निफिकेंट चेंज टू द फील्ड The Biennial Aero India exhibition provides an excellent opportunity for aerospace leaders to showcase the latest systems and technologies relevant to the Indian market. One of the largest foreign exhibits at the air show this year is Israel's National Pavilion, organized by CBAT, Israel's International Defense Cooperation Directorate. Israel's National Pavilion showcases the latest, most advanced systems and technologies developed by the country's defense industries. with military and civil applications related to air, land, naval and space. 
The display highlights the strategic aspect of intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance provided by different systems. These range from satellites, special mission aircraft to reconnaissance pods and electro-optical payloads carried by combat aircraft, helicopters or drones. Carrier asks, what does comfort mean to you? Is it a cool breeze on a scorching day? Or a cozy corner on a cold night? That every room of the house is as inviting as the next. And the air is fresh and clean for everyone. But humidity is where it belongs. At Carrier, comfort means more than just the temperature. And the people who invented modern air conditioning keep inventing new ways to make you comfortable. However you define it. Human studies are now ready to begin to confirm meaningful reversal of pathological aging processes. These clinical trials aim to alter older humans so that they function as much younger individuals. Even modest success will result in a paradigm shift that will impart enormous societal benefits, such as sparing Medicare from insolvency. Life extension is not standing idle while 5,000 Americans die each day from age-related illnesses. This concludes our special show for today. I'm Maya Brandt. Thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.